check out the guy behind me, the one sinking all the shots. You probably recognize him. Carvel Anderson, AKA the best kept secret, that sharpshooter from Robert Morris University. He scored over a thousand points in just the two years that he played here. But what you probably don't know about him is that he was actually homeless in high school, living in a park all by himself. Well, today I'm gonna step onto the court with him, the place that he always could call his home, and find out what the real story is behind the best kept secret. All right, Carvel, I'm not completely convinced that I actually just beat you at horse. I think you might have let me win. No, I didn't. Um, a little rusty. Had a time. Had a couple times off from the gym. I need to obviously get back in here and work on my craft. But you won that one fair and square. <laughs> I give it to you. It's hard to believe, though. I mean, I've seen you. I watched you play all season long, sinking shots from all over the floor. How did you get into basketball? Um, you know, when I was younger, I just kind of did it to kind of keep me out of trouble. You know, I started at a young age, you know, five or six playing, just having fun. Yeah. Um, and then once I started taking it serious, it was just kind of just to keep me from the environment I was surrounded in. And, you know, I started to develop the love for it and passion took it from there. Yeah, and you're bringing up that environment. You grew up in uh, Elkhart, Indiana. <clears throat> Wasn't exactly the best place. Uh, they were going through some troubles, right, mm -hmm. when you were growing up there? Yeah. What was going on? Um, you know, financially and, you know, uh, with the economy, it just was a big downfall. We, our environment is based a lot off of like the, the Hummer industry um, and the RV industry, and both of those took a, a big decline in, in um, jobs and employ, uh, employment. So, you know, when a lot of people got laid off, the town kind of started to fall apart a little bit. Um, and then, you know, people resorted to different methods of, um, you know, providing for their families and that kind of you know, it was bad for the for the community. People started the drug route and, um, you know, a lot of violence and stuff started happening. So, you know, that's really when Elkhart kind of took a turn for the worst. Yeah, and you were one of those people that were affected by that, right? Didn't you have a single mom? Yeah, I did. Um, you know, she tried, you know, just like everyone else, tried to provide for us the best way she knew how. Um, she got laid off. I don't know if it was due to the, you know, in connection with the, the economy or whatever, but she got laid off around the same time. and you know, tried to find other means for, you know, putting food on the table and it kind of got her in a little bit of trouble. So how did um, you end up, I think a lot of people don't know about this, first of all, but how did you end up being homeless, living in a park when you were only in high school? Um, you know, it kind of, you know, when I look back on it now, it was, it was a pride thing. I had a, um, I had a place where I could have went to stay, um, you know, with my uncle and, and uh, my step aunt, uh, but, a few years before that, him and I kind of got into a big argument of falling out and, you know, we hadn't been on speaking terms, you know, that entire time. And um, it kind of felt like a like a charity offer when, you know, he offered us to come stay with him. And, you know, I didn't want to. I was too prideful. I was too stubborn, too hard headed at the time to, yeah. you know, get out of my own way. And, um, you know, I just that was my only other option. And I took it. I kind of needed some alone time anyway. Yeah. I can't even imagine, though, being homeless and just being a kid in high school. What was that like? I mean, how did you go to school and, you know, do things like shower and find mm -hmm. food? Um, you know, I did a lot because it was a little easier because it was close to the park I was in, McNaughton Park. It was close to, to my high school, so it was in walking distance for me to go to the high school. And I would always work out um, with my coach and my assistant coach at 530 in the morning before classes and stuff. So. Uh -huh. Um, you know, I'd go in there and work out and then just use the locker room to shower and bathe and, you know, get myself together. And then, you know, they provided us with, with breakfast and stuff at the school. So, you know, I ate breakfast and lunch at school. And sometimes I ate dinner at night, sometimes I didn't. But, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't as, as harsh as it may sound coming off, but it definitely was a difficult thing. Yeah. Um, I had to, you know, I hid it from people for, for a very long time. I would always have people, if I got a ride from school, they'd have them drop me off at some house where I have no idea who stays there and act like I'm walking to the door. As soon as they pull off, I walk across the street to the park, so. Oh, wow. Yeah. So obviously you didn't stay there forever, though. How, what changed for you? What turned it all around? How'd you get out of that situation? And um, Gerald Jackson, um, you know, he's an assistant coach at my high school. Uh, he wasn't at the time. He was the following year, he was gonna be our assistant coach. and. You know, he's just one of those guys around the neighborhood who, who works kids out and, you know, he's like a, you know, a, a role model, a father figure to anybody, you know, whoever needs it or wants it, you know, he's that for them. And, 
you know, he used to come to the park and watch us play. Um, and him and I talked a little bit. He told me that he was going to be taking a job at, you know, my school. It would be my sophomore year. Um, him and I just got close. And then once I finally got comfortable with him and trust him a little bit, um, you know, I told him my situation. And, you know, he talked to me and he kind of, he took me out of there for a while and let me stay with him and his wife for a little bit. And so and he's the guy who actually convinced me to kind of mend the relationship that my uncle and I had. And, you know, then I ended up going to stay with my uncle. So, you know, yeah. I think I credit all that to Coach Jackson. Oh, well, that's so nice. You know, it all worked out in that way. Mm -hmm. But another thing that's pretty interesting, I think, about you, a lot of guys who are at your level playing the way you do at basketball and got to the Division One level played AAU basketball, but mm -hmm. you didn't play AAU, right? Never. Not once. That's something I regret. You know, if I would have had the opportunity, I definitely would have. I wasn't presented with it, so, you know, I kind of had to do it out. So how did you get discovered? How'd you end up at RMU without AU? Um, a long route. Three junior colleges. Um, you know, I went to Butler Community College in Kansas, and then I left and uh, went to Lake Michigan Community College in, um, in Benton Harbor, Michigan. And then I finally ended up at Glen Oaks Community College in small town, Centerville, Michigan. Um, you know, he kind of my junior college coach at uh, Glen Oaks, Coach Profrock, he was in need of, of the type of player that I was at the time. And, and obviously I was in need of a place to play that could kind of give me some exposure. And he had a lot of young guys. He needed somebody who was a sophomore who could just come in and, you know, kind of be a leader, score some points and, you know, kind of carry the program for that year while he developed his other players. And, you know, I was perfect for that. Thankfully, the only time he ever seen me play in high school was my senior night when I broke the school record. So his only vision of me was the, the 49 points he seen in high school. So all he wanted me to do was come score. So that was fun for me. 49 points in yeah. one game. Yeah, it broke the, the school record. Wow. Well, you broke a lot of records here too mm -hmm. and scored over a thousand points in just two years. That's pretty impressive. Um, yeah, yeah it is. I guess you could say that. What was it like it playing way. for Andy Toll? It was great. Um, you know, even more so off the court. He did so much for me as a person, you know, honestly, as a man, you know, you know, I got him right when I was kind of growing up a little bit. I had already been forced to grow up, you know, at earlier parts of my of my young adulthood. But when I got here, I was kind of settled in a little bit. I had finally got obviously a division one offer that, you know, that I wanted to. And but now it was time that everything I've been chasing for was right in front of me. And I hadn't had anybody to kind of help me manage and, and, and steer me in the right direction. And, you know, he did that for me. I didn't, I'm out here by myself, you know, my family's back in Indiana. So, you know, he looks out for me and, you know, he takes care of his guys. And he's one of the few coaches that, that I've met. Um, you know, all the coaches I've had have been this way, but him even more so is he really cares about the person that you can become. You know, he tries yeah. to make you a better person and a better basketball player. Yeah. Um, but to him, off the court comes first. So, you know, that's one thing I love about him and I have so much respect for him. And he developed my game. You know, he and he made me a better player, be made me become a better leader. You know, watching film with him is like doing math problems. He breaks it down to the smallest little details and, yeah. and you know, and he forces you to become better. And you said off the court, you know, that's a big priority for him, mm -hmm. for you guys. That's another thing that you really excelled at, you know, from high school to college. How mm -hmm. much have you learned to appreciate, you know, the school side of it? And um, a lot because, you know, if I would have appreciated it a little more at the beginning, then, you know, I might not have had to take as long a route as I did to get here. But then again, maybe I wouldn't be here. So I'm kind of thankful for how I played out. But. You know, he helped me kind of focus a little more. You know, you have to get this or you can't play. And, you know, even the summer before I came here, you know, I needed 18 credits in the summer to get eligible to play Division One. And, you know, he just was calling me every day nonstop. Like, you got this done. You turn this paper in. Like, do this. Like, you got to do this. You know, so he kind of, you know, disciplined me academically. And it's, it's definitely been beneficial for me. Yeah, so you're going to be the first person from your family to graduate from college, right? Mm -hmm. How huge is that to you? Um, it's a huge thing. I had my grandmother, she went to college, but um, she ended up having, I don't know if it was my mom or my aunt, but she had a kid and mm -hmm. she had to drop out and you know kind of take care of her family. And um, then it's just me and my younger sister, she's going to, she's in college now, but you know, I'll be her to graduate. And so I kind of have that on my shoulder. It's yeah. just an amazing feeling. You know, I'm somebody that, you know, my family looks up to and you know, I, I take that and I like it. How much? 
is it like, how nice is it to see, you know, your little sister going to college and following in your footsteps and, you know, looking up to you? Um, it makes me feel like I actually did something because, you know, and I didn't take no credit away from my mother at all. Great parent, you know, um, she did everything she could. But, um, you know, the times that were hard, it was just us. And, you know, me and my sisters kind of fend for each other and we, we pushed each other and motivated each other. So, you know, I'm glad to see that I wasn't the only one strong enough to survive it and, you know, and try to better themselves. And, you know, she moved all the way to North Carolina to go to school. So. Um, and she kind of did the same thing I did. I went all the way to Kansas, and thankfully she didn't come back her second year, so she's stronger than me. And plus, she was she was a little more gifted academically. She's the the brains of the fa of the three of us, so you know I'm proud of her. How much do you think all the things that you've been through and all the adversities you've dealt with? How much do you think that has just made you stronger and better and turned you into the Carvel Anderson that? This whole community at RMU knows you to be. Um, you know, I definitely think it's the reason why I am who I am. You know, I tell people all the time that in, in my eyes, you know, what I've been through, you know, adversity, you know, obstacles have been the, the best thing that could have happened in my life. Um, you know, I'm a self-motivated person, so when things happen that, you know, are supposed to make you do this, I do the other things. So, you know, adversity has definitely changed me and, and shaped me and molded me to become who I am. and. You know, a lot of people shy away from it. I don't, you know, I go face it head on and, you know, I credit that again for, you know, why I'm here. So through all those adversities though, you've really gotten to do some pretty cool things. Like recently you were in that Reese's All-Star yeah. game. How sweet was that? That was amazing. Um, one of the funnest experiences I've had basketball wise, just because the whole, you know, I, I got down there for on Wednesday and stayed until Sunday, yeah. you know, down there for the whole Final Four event. Um, you know, my favorite part is we got to go visit a children's hospital, and I had never been to one before, mm -hmm. you know, and that was probably my favorite experience of the trip. It was just a humbling experience. And then being uh, being able to play in the Dallas Cowboys Stadium, yeah. you know, that's something not many people could say. You know, I didn't get to play in the tournament, but, you know, at the All-Star Game, we played on the final floor, on the final four floor, and, you know, it just was a great experience. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. Another thing, you were on ESPN, right? Top plays? Um... I don't know. What was that? Were you? What was Where? the thing I saw on Instagram? You were oh, videoing yeah, on yeah, ESPN. Yeah. What was for that the, from? From the St. John's game. Yeah. I was, yeah, that was crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, they showed the highlights from the from the St. John's game, the 38 point performance. And when we turned on ESPN, it just said like 38 point performance. So I'm like, it's got to be me. <laughs> um, and then later that night, they do like uh, top three stars of the night. Yeah. And um, I was one of those three stars, and that was. That was just crazy to me. I'm in the, I mean, I'm in the hotel, just excited, and I'm recording it on my iPad, and you know, I just was, I just never had nothing like that before. But that was so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Where would you rank that on one of your favorite sports moments ever? Well, um, what the For game you. or just being or, on? Well, yeah, the being on the ESPN or. Um, it's definitely up there. It's probably right now it might be top, you know, individually as yeah. a team, the Kentucky moment, but. Individually, that's probably my most memorable, you know, accolade that I have. You know, it's just, I don't know. When I seen that, I got like goosebumps and yeah. my heart started beating fast. It just was crazy that, you just think of how many people watch ESPN and, you know, it's just, and they got to see me that night. So it was, it was fun. That's, yeah, really crazy. Yeah. Can't imagine turning on the TV and <laughs> seeing myself. <laughs> like, what about the Kentucky thing though? How cool mm. is that for you guys to be able to beat Kentucky here on your own floor, and then even this year, see them mm -hmm. in the finals. Uh, yeah, it was, um, it definitely was fun. The whole two days leading up to the Kentucky game, you know, it was probably the, the most excitement around this campus that mm -hmm. I've seen in my two years here. Um, you know, a lot of people definitely were supporting us. It was the best fan support we've had ever. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, the win, I think, was a huge thing for the for us, for the program, for the school, and even for the conference, you know, such a huge thing for the NEC. Um, you know, now this conference is somebody that they just look at and walk over. You know, we have some big time wins in this league, so, you know, that did a lot for us. And then I was kind of kind of pushing for Kentucky to win the, the championship just because we could say we beat them. We're the last team to beat them in the tournament. So, but, um, you know, they're a great team, great program. And just that win did so much for, for everybody here. Mm -hmm. So what's next for you? Um, kind of focusing on graduating first and I'm going through the selecting the agent process, one of the most stressful processes I've had to had to endure. 
um, and then hopefully, you know, try to play professionally. You know, I hope I get that opportunity, but that's definitely a goal of mine. Well, with everything you've been through, I'm sure you're going to be just fine. <laughs> One more. So. What is the best kept secret? It's your nickname. What's mm -hmm. it mean? Um, just kind of something that stuck with me since high school. I'm always, you know, when I was growing up, people always told me I could never play Division One. I, I could never do this and do that, and I wasn't good enough. Or at the time, I was too small or too skinny, or it was always too something why I couldn't. And you know, I kind of got overlooked because of some of those things. And you know, the long route I took kind of took, put me under the radar a little bit. And I think a lot of people sleep on me. You know, when it comes to basketball, and it's it's also just something that keeps me humble, no matter okay. how much success. I have gained or may gain in the future, and you know, it's just something that I like to be an uh, underdog, so to speak, and you know, it keeps me grounded. Well, it's definitely your thing, and I think you're going to be remembered <laughs> for a long time here at Robert Morris. Yeah, I hope so. But I'm always going to remember beating you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for a rematch? I'm ready. I got to redeem myself. All right, guys, I'm Abby Way with 93.7 The Fan. This is Carvel Anderson, the best kept secret. For more videos, check out 93.7thefan.com. See ya.